Hello, I'm Don Ward. I'm Chief Executive of CIB and welcome to the latest in our series, CIB in Conversation, in which we meet the personalities and the leaders in the world of research and innovation around the world. CIB, Conseiller International du Batiment in French, is the global network for collaboration in research and innovation in, in the built environment. More about that on our, on, on our website. Um, today, it's early in January 2022, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Peter McDermott, Professor of Construction Procurement and Management, School of Science, Engineering and Environment at the University of Salford. Peter, hello. Hi, John. How are Good you? To see you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. Happy New Year. It is. Happy New Year. 6th of January. Yes. Six days it's, in. Yeah. It's very so, dark uh, here in, in the northwest of England. Yeah, and you're busy marking, uh, I hear. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is a lovely break from um, learning lots, as I always do, from our, our students, our master's students, um, who've done a, some excellent work on procuring for value for their, um, as a, uh, their the master's level module. Cool. So at Salford, you're charged with leading industry and policy engagement regionally and nationally. So that, that's what we're going to uh, end up talking about. You're, you and I know each, have known each other a long time through your role as a board member of the National Constructing Excellence Organization in the UK, where I was chief executive for some some number of years actually um and um but in cib terms i know you're your your coordinator of w working commission w92 on procurement systems and we're going to talk about that as well but um peter instead of me introducing you why don't you introduce yourself what's your current role involvement in the world of research and innovation in our sector thank you john uh and yes we do go back a few years and in some ways i consider we've been um just on a mirror opposite in a way you've been on the side of uh, working in in the policy side and, and best practice and i've been on the inside in academia um uh, trying to operate in a very similar environment as yourself i think which is on the boundaries between research practice teaching and industry and um i've been at Salford for quite some time now i've been privileged and um, where i've been allowed to to stay in that place and the, the balance changes over the years, but um, I'm Professor of Construction Procurement and Management. Um, I teach, I research, we do applied work. Um, I'm very aware and have listened to some of the excellent presentations from your other interviewees uh, in, uh, in conversation. And you know, we, we, many of us who are in this space are really privileged in the way that we've been allowed to earn our living. And, I consider myself as a scholar of the construction sector, and we'll talk about construction procurement in a moment, but I, I consider myself a scholar there. And the majority of the work that I've done through my recent career, and particularly at Salford, is teaching research and enterprise. And it is that engagement with our master's students where um, we, we really uh, develop our ideas. And What's your particular specialist interest in terms of, of, of research? You, you, you've alluded to procurement, but, but, but just say a little bit more about some of that. Yeah, um, I, procurement is a very, a very strange subject, or it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and indeed, we might talk about this when we talk about CIB 92. When CIB 92, its first iteration was contract arrangements. But I am a like to think I'm a scholar of the construction sector, got a passion for change in the industry. And one of the major levers to bring about change in the industry is through good procurement. Um, if you're going to bring about um, change within the construction sector, whether it be in operations, whether it be in the outcomes, um, social, environmental um, outcomes from the industry, how are you going to bring that about in developed markets economies? It might be through legislation, and we, we're used to legislation for you know, health and safety. Um, there might be some, but one thing that governments throughout the world have always looked for and policymakers is if we want to bring about change, if it's not legislation, we'll do it through the power of the pound or the dollar or the yen. So that was, that's what really interested me from my early career about the power of procurement to bring about that change. Excellent. Well, so you've you've talked to you referred to your early career. Let, what, what's your background? We have lots of early career researchers and uh, students who who watch these uh, conversations. How, how did you get started? How did you come oh into the gosh. world of academia? I, 
I have to say, don't I? Um, I, I did a degree in quantity surveying and lots of people start there and do different things. And it was a very good grounding. Um, that, that I was always interested in the construction sector because of uh, family connections. Um, and as I was growing up, I, I could see the, how the industry was operated, particularly the employment patterns, um, the scarcity of scarcity of work, the geographical uh, impact um, it had on people um, and family lives and things like that. Um, within the family, we had scaffolders and contract managers and plumbers and and so on and um having done a levels i wasn't quite sure what i should do next and i did i did i went into and started off as an insurance underwriter clerk for insurance underwriters but then that was just while i was finding my feet and i saw then within that professional environment which is well, this is pre-computers never mind pre-internet um just saw the changes that were coming there and how well they were um, looking after graduates. And then really then I thought, I'll go back and do a degree. And I went back and did a degree in quantity surveying. And at the time, um, it was really just that security that if you're going, you need to, it, it was very recessionary time at that particular point. So you needed that safety for a cushion. And in, in, that, in the construction sector, um, at the time, um, if you're going into surveying, it was it was a relatively um, good opportunities there and, and relatively secure. Uh, but what I think what it gave me then, it, it reignited a, the final year in particular of the quantity surveying degree. Looking back was very good. It was development economics, production economics, um, what I suppose what we call now information management before BIM. And it was that that whet my appetite and a... Um, I'd, and even value and value management and from there then I went into industry and I was working quite happily as a as a QS in industry and then one day um, I saw in building magazine a tiny little advertisement literally that big which advertised a, a one-year research contract at Brunel University in West London and it, it caught my attention pure by chance and I th it was a one-year contract on um, investigating the sources, causes, and effects of variations on building contracts, and that I applied for that. Um, I went back to my tutors at the time at, at what was Liverpool Polytechnic, and I showed them a, this. I've been offered this job here. <laughs> what does that mean, being a research assistant? And, and they encouraged me and I went. And um, that job at Brunel University with excellent professors, eventually became professors, Professor Dave Langford, Richard, Richard Fellows, Bob Newcomb, um, other PhD people at the time, Steve Rowlandson from W92, uh, PD Ralima did his master's. So it, was a, it really introduced me to um, the subject matter of change in the construction sector. The subject matter of what we eventually became and spoke of as procurement, the subject matter of what we now call social value, because yeah. we were looking at um, some of the early work that we did was around um, looking at the development, developmentally orientated procurement systems versus conventionally orientated procurement systems. And so that's what got me the, into the academia. And it, we eventually then got a further extension to that contract. So I ended up being there three years. I had three years going around the southeast of England, looking at 2021 case studies, just really um, learning about how the sector and what we now call procurement operated. And eventually wrote that up as a PhD on a social technical analysis of the building process with special regard to variations and changes in contracts. Pause. Very good. Very, very good. And, um, you know, you've you've acknowledged there a number of your early um, supervisors and men and mentors. Have you got any tips of advice for students who might find themselves in a similar position to yourself? Uh, um, you know, what, how to make the best of of, of that type of opportunity? Uh, yeah, I suppose it, it was pretty unique. This was quite a long time ago now, and um, P PhD opportunities are, are being advertised in our field of construction management was very unusual. If I recall at the time, it was um, the funding came from what is now the EPSRC, a uh, different name then, and it came through a specially promoted programme in construction management. 
And so it did, it, it, it sucked in a few people like myself, recent graduates, some in London, some in Leeds, I think, some in Liverpool, who, and some who went on to be academics. But so going back, and what I really enjoyed at the time was, um, and the advice of being given was, go and immerse yourself into it, mix with those other academics, whether the researchers or even if they are seen to be senior professors. Um, and if I look back, fellows Langford, Newcomb and the other researchers, they, they were friends and colleagues um, um, and that you just learn so much from people from those different backgrounds. Right. Immerse yourself in it. Yeah. Treat everybody the same. PhD students through to professors and just abs absorb it. For me at the time, it was learning about the subject matter, but also how to be a researcher. And that was that was vital. That that's eventually what changes your mindset. I provoke my own students now, master's students or PhD students, with I suppose my lessons from them were um, we, many of our students come in and they are strongly within their discipline. They are an engineer or they're an architect or a surveyor. And quite often I provoke them by saying, I'm going to turn you into a social scientist because a lot most of the work that we do. And then um, I just poke, poke a wee bit because that, that's what happened to me. I immersed myself in soft research um, in systems thinking and systems practice. And I think that's what changed my mindset over a three to four, five year period in my mid twenties. And um, having, uh, having got to where you were then in your early career, done the PhD, how, how, how did you come to find yourself at Salford? Um, oh, gosh, there was a, a two or three steps from there. I stayed in the London area for about uh, nine to ten years. Uh, my first, I taught at Kingston, what was Kingston Poly, um, um, Kingston University. And I suppose reflecting through those times in my late 20s, early 30s, the industry was different, and I, I, I always had a, a, a big toe or a, a, or a foot within industry. All of the work that I did was applied, um, and some t one or two occasions, I nearly flipped and went back to industry completely. Um, that's a, 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 a longer story. But the um, from Kingston University, where I was immersed in teaching and developing programs, um, I purposefully looked up after five years and said well this is going really well and I think there was a career trajectory there which was a teaching and an admin and I was as a relatively young man I was on the steering group for the academic board and I, I think at that point it did make a purpose purposeful change sometimes life is what happens to you isn't it mm -hmm. but this is when I did step back and say well actually I'd like to reconnect uh, a bit more with my own subject matter because I felt the admin and management was going one way. And so the first job I took was um, back in uh, Liverpool, John Moores, as is now, because that was a sponsored position with what was called Buckingham Austin. And so that was deliberately set up with four days a week academia and one day with industry. And it was that that I was really trying to hold on to. And I think, thanks to Salford, I, I like to think of managed to keep that balance from the academic base, of course, but still working closely with industry. So the opportunity after working at John Moores and Buckland Lawson came along and I, I, I jumped from there to the University of Salford. Um, not, not everyone will know that's about 30 miles, 30 miles between the two. The University of Salford at the time um, was renowned for its broad construction management and information technology research. And we were working a lot with the other, other core built environment universities, Loughboroughs and Reddings and Heriot Watts. And it was that that attracted me to work at the University of Salford. On a day-to-day -day basis as well, um, my, the program that I was teaching on was very attractive to me because it was a an undergraduate program, we developed our master's programs later. It was an undergraduate program, but it was sponsored by 10 of the big contractors. And so it was a, what we call then a thin sandwich program. And again, it was, it was that, 
connection to industry, working with industry and teaching their employees, essentially. So I, I suppose in the, just reflecting on what I've told you there, I, I've just always been trying to keep on that boundaries between industry, universities, and I think we might talk in a wee bit with policy. Yes, and that's a very um, uh, clear for, for, from your background. I, um, I think uh, not, not all our uh, leading academics have as, as much interface and experience of, of the industry that, that you bring or, or indeed the interest uh, that you've brought. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the area of uh, procurement and uh, you, you've touched on government policy and you've touched on social value. Where, where, where's, this, uh, where's the research agenda at for you at the moment? Um, okay, um, where to begin with this? Um, I'm, I'm going to still try to keep that connection because reflecting on this for you is making me think about it, um, where, where, it, where it did come from. I think one, I always had that passion for change in the, in the industry bef uh, before I entered academia. Um, and I, I perhaps stumbled upon this job, which led me into, um, led me into uh, the, the PhD field of doing a, um, a sense about change in the construction sector. Um, now, at the time, um, the obsession in the industry was with contractual arrangements and um, we're moving away from the tra traditional procurement systems towards um, any NEC forms of contract. And the discussions were always just around the detailed forms. What I'd learned from the research that I'd done and I, I really like it when, and I could give some examples of other people who I admire and the this, this scholarship work that they've done, where they do the policy work, but it's still rooted in the theory. So a lot of the work we do now, um, and some of the policy documents that have come out are excellent, but I think the best ones are where they're not hiding their theoretical underpinnings, where they're not, where they can expose them. So there's some, and so the, the theory that has influenced me whenever I've been working with policymakers or industry is basics, social science, um, systems thinking, systems practice. Um, um, uh, uh, things like resource-based resource theories of the firm, um, markets, economies. And so I've always drawn upon those kinds of things then to explain the phenomena that we're working in. That might be through formal research projects with PhD students or sponsored EPRC work. But also, I think, and I've, I've, I've picked this up from a, some of your other conversations with, with academics, is that you can bring that into the policy forums that you work in. So my, my view is that I am a, a scholar of the construction sector but I have a passion for change. That passion for change comes from, as I alluded to earlier, if you can't legislate for change, what about procuring for change and procuring for value? Now, the value of societies and the value of clients, the values change over time. And so procurement for me is the lever for bringing about positive and progressive change in our industry. Now, my early career was around... Um, and a lot of the work that you were doing in parallel was around improvement to payment practices, um, better contracts and frame, and you know, therefore have moved on to framework arrangements as a means of aggregating demand and bringing about change. And so it is procurement as the lever for change that is my, is my driver. Where's that agenda at now, Peter, okay. you know, uh, today? Yeah, good one. Um, so, the language that we used and in some of the, uh, there's a, a, a book that we edited with Steve Rawlinson in, in um, gosh, 20 years ago now, and we drew from scholars around the world. And what they were telling us was about developmentally orientated procurement systems, you know, very, very heavy language and, and jargon. And that was in South Africa, in the new South Africa that had been um, born um, and in the Southern States of America where procurement had been used for, progressive change within the sector to um, bring about change in, in the new South Africa, the reconstruction development program there, um, uh, uh, used procurement in order to stimulate work for the previously excluded community. So we were drawing all of that, all, all of that in. In the UK, rightly or wrongly, we started using the term social value 
And because in 2012, there was a Social Value Act, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, the Social Value Act defined um, social value as, um, in broad terms, around bringing about change, social, environmental, and economic change through the way that you spend the pound, the dollar, or, or, or the yen. Um, and so I'm quite happy to use that umbrella term now for what, as academics, we would have called policy through procurement, what we would have called developmentally orientated procurement systems. What we, um, and so the social values become that. Um, a lot of the work I've done and do with my students is just show them that all of the policy documents that you will be familiar with, Don, in the UK, everything from the Latham Review to the Egan Report through to the Farmer Report, and then behind those, the policy instruments within the UK, the exercise I do with my students quite often is to go through, through them and get them to say, when governments have wanted to improved skills when governments have wanted to um, bring about um, improved green performance of housing when governments have wanted to stimulate innovation what do they do they don't go to legislation they say we're going to procure for this and we're going to require this and we're going to put it into our procurement systems so my work has started in i like to think in that academic sphere of identifying values but the work that we've done has been to help translate that and you did some of that work yourself back in constructing excellence um, of translating that work through into real procurement systems so i could give a couple of examples that's good and um you know, as we speak, um, we're experiencing the massive spike in infections um, in COVID-19 as a result of the Omicron variant. So um, how would you describe or how can you see the potential impact of COVID-19 in your field? Well, um, I, I can respond to that from a, a research and teaching perspective and on a very personal level. Um, you know, we're speaking now in... Uh, early January it's it's not quite two years since we, we we've been working to COVID and personally I find it very difficult I'm doing re research and teaching it's 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 working with people um, I've been involved in short-term enterprise research projects over the last 18 months where we've I've never met the people we're working with and, and that on a personal level it is so difficult and um, most of our teaching has gone online now i'm very comfortable with distance learning teaching we've done it for 15 to 20 years um but still um i found this and i've just taught a big module before christmas done um and a lot of i used to do that face to face one version and distance learning the other and it's so incredibly hard when you're in that when you're in a, a lecture theater you can tell if you're connecting or not just by the body language yes. and, and the faces. Um, I found when all that's gone online, I'm having to ask them all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, did that make sense? Have you got that? Um, so on that personal level, I think it, it's very difficult. You'll be aware there's a recording on the CIB website that um, through WCIB, W92 and others, we, we did bring together 15 months ago now a... Uh, um, a webinar on what, what might the impact be on the construction sector. Um, I, I realise how privileged you've been in this regard. Um, I'm sitting here now, University of Salford, over my left shoulder. It says my department, School of Science and Engineering and Environment. And that's an art, artist's impression of a building that um, we, we had a small, just tiny part to play in this procurement, it's being procured through a framework, being procured through a framework that we are familiar with and support uh, as academics. But I've worked from home all of this time. That building is almost complete. The construction sector didn't stop. Our economy did, did in, in deepest lockdown, everything did stop, construction kept going. And I think one of the things I'm really interested in, and in the UK, it was the, um, the construction leadership councils that's taken the lead on this did fantastic work in keeping building sites open but they themselves have started to reflect upon 
the employment patterns within the UK and they and they themselves and this is an area where I look at procurement but it's the real world construction sector to bring procurement to bring about the change and this is the things I'm particularly fascinated and want to do more work on in the next year or two if possible Don is the construction leadership council the employers the big companies there who have said perhaps we need because of COVID and perhaps I could mention Grenfell and Carillion as well um, because of these major changes to society in recent years that perhaps we need to move towards a different kind of employment model in construction that the extent of subcontracting that went on over 10 20 30 years um went too far and that the clc themselves have called for clients and the public sector clients to favor somehow or to reward through procurement those um tier one contractors that do employ directly now i think that would be a fascinating um thing to follow through on which i'm trying to do but also it, it helps me to bring the two parts of what we've talked about together for me procurement is important it's not just contractual arrangements it's the lever for change and um that lever for change is to reward companies that deliver against the values that we, that we want and if we're going to procure for value that's one value that we that clc um, we could have a look at. Very good. I know that's been a, a constant theme, um, in, certainly in my career, uh, the, the difficulties um, caused by the subcontracting model. So um, let's hope that uh, there may be some progress on this in this area. Just, just one more say. sentence on that, Don, because I think that's helped me to bring it together. So um, when people say, what well, Professor of Construction Procurement, even people in our industry, sometimes procurement well but it's procurement for something and it has been procurement for positive and progressive change i think um and even some other fellow academics um um who um are, who are commenting on the construction sector um just see procurement as the problem and procurement is potentially the solution if we have over a 10 or 20 30 year period uh, move towards and there's a great paper i stumbled on just before christmas by an american i'll, I'll send it to you afterwards which is um, entitled construction the original gig economy and right. yeah yeah I've, I've wanted to write that one myself for years <laughs> but, <laughs> but really but really well well researched and con construction is the original gig economy um improved procurement in my view and using pre good procurement is, is almost the antidote to the increased fragmentation well peter feel free to uh blog on this feel free to use the cib channels to uh you know stimulate and raise the uh, profile of, of debates on on uh, on such a theme in what you were saying there you referred to cib so um how did you first get involved in in cib Gosh, um, it, now, this is, I think, yeah, this is this is just genuine, Don. I know you and I know each other through Constructing Excellence, but CIB was there from the beginning. I told you I responded to um, an advertisement in building. I had a one-year contract at Brunel University. Um, we, we applied in, in the September for an extension. We found out in the November we did, but it, it could have just been that one-year position. And so I knocked on the door of a, of a professional body in London and said, I'm one of your students and you have a scholarship scheme. Can you give me a few, a few pounds, please? And he did. And I went to, this is what I was saying to, um, when speaking to younger researchers now, there wasn't much funding around, but I, I politely knocked on the door of the professor of mechanical engineering, as it was, and said, I've got... I've got a little bit of funding here, can you? And so, so the department threw some money in and I paid and went off to, to two CIB conferences, one in Canada, which just blew my mind, um, with academics from, from the world over. One was CIB 65, Construction Management, and 
which was in Toronto. And then down the road, the week later, there was a conference at CIB Waterloo, University of Waterloo. And so I, I got, by sleeping on floors and um, looking up old friends and things like that, I got to go to these two broadly based working commissions, W65 construction management, and then W55 building economics. And I was working on a, as I've explained before, as everybody does, on a, a quite a narrow field of study. And what has allowed me to do was to position that and to understand construction management as a discipline, and also building economics and the economics of buildings and development economics. So CIB gave me the subject matter and it gave me the contacts and the leads. And it, I, um, I could tell you that people have met there and still know some of them now, but, but also then as you go off and become, as most of us do, go into teaching, that was my teaching base as well, as well as allowing me to position my small contribution within my PhD, within the, the wider field. So it really did um, serve. Then fast forward and we, with others, we helped form CIB W92, which was procurement systems. In many ways, if you like a splinter group of W65, but, but really to, to, to make that argument about procurement driving the driver for change. The first meeting, which uh, I looked up because of this meeting was, um, I think it was at, it was, it was in Liverpool in, in 89, but it was about contractual arrangements. And then that started the debate and we broadened it out into procurement as being the, the driver for change. So you're now coordinator um, of W92. So having, having got it set up around about 2000, mid 2000s, um, it's, it's been going 15 years. Uh, you're joint coordinator with Steve Rawlinson, who you've, you've mentioned. Um, where, where, where are you at with that group now? Well, um, be just before Christmas, Steve and I have been talking again, um, and he's Australian based. So we're, we're, we're looking now to re reinvigorate CIB W92. Um, uh, let's step outside of procurement systems for a moment. Within our, within our broad field, we all use different language and the language will come and language will go. Um, I mentioned earlier, even as long as I got my undergraduate degree, we were talking about value management and information management. And now, for example, um, we, we have BIM and digital. I, I feel over the next few years that, that because it's becoming more normalized and the younger generations are just getting on and doing digital. It'll just be information management. So we've been trying to look at procurement and I think we, we, we grabbed the moment 20 years ago because of changes in industry worldwide and also within developed, developed economies like the UK for those drivers for change around procurement. And we just made that argument, be honest and open about where you, where you are trying to use procurement as, as that lever. We defined it broadly as being to deliver value or values, and that meant social, economic, and environmental outcomes. Um, so the re recent discussions we, we've had just before Christmas, but in the last commission meeting, which was about 18 months ago, um, was how to reconnect. And lots of work in our field is going, going on in North America, in Australia, around integrated project development. And we've either got to tweak CIB procurement systems um, or to incorporate IPD and incorporate, I would argue, for um, some aspects of the social value agenda as well. But that's the debate we want, we want, to, we want to go forward on. And we, we genuinely, uh, Steve and I, uh, genuinely do really want to uh, keep that momentum going in that subject area. But we're at that stage where we are very cool about what it will become. Okay. How would you describe the value of CIB to others then based on um, where you're at, but also your own experience and how it helped with the, how it helped support the development of your own, own career? Um, Gordon, I, good question. Um, I, I can link this back to some of the experience we've had. Um, I've had great fun. Um, you and 
you and I have collided in the in the mm-hmm. in the policy world around constructing excellence. So within the UK, whenever there was a a major initiative, Salford allowed me to, but I was also keen to do it. Is to align with if there's a change initiative going on, if it's Latham, if it's Egan, if it's Farmer, um, well, we should be there as the academics. Um, and so I've always just tried to. Um, work with with those kinds of initiatives lead me back to the question sorry don uh, what's the value of cib okay. um, so, to to, to yeah. others uh, early career researchers so i've had i've had great fun when we've had the opportunity to host cib w92 or when we host the cib world congress because what we've done in buildings like that there we've got the the local industry the regional industry in the room at the same time as our researchers in the room at the same time as our academics and i've really sometimes um it's been designed and we've had workshops sometimes it's just throwing these wonderfully different people in the room together and seeing what happens and so for that's what cib allowed me when i was when i was more of a grown-up if you like to to do for for researchers i think that's what coordinators are doing on your behalf the the bringing together the academics and the industry and as a younger researcher get in there and just enjoy the enjoy the sparks that should be flying there and um i've really enjoyed it for example um oh when we've hosted w92 at salford and i've had some of the big regional procurement frameworks um presenting a best practice approach and you have researchers from the other side of the world who are seeing that when i've gone to cib i remember one in in the netherlands and um, when we went to the netherlands it's their practitioners who are in the room and i'm learning from their practitioners so cib is where where all that collides as a young researcher get in there and absorb it superb well uh peter we've come to the end of our uh time unfortunately um before we finish i like to ask all our guests for your top opportunity and and what i mean by that in your field of expertise broadly speaking procuring for change um what would you say is the top opportunity or challenge that you'd like to put out there for politicians and policy makers around the world well um I normally try to break that down, you know, internationally, nationally, and regionally. Um, but in, in the UK, um, we've got, well, everyone's got the challenge of COVID at the moment. But for our for our sector, we've had two other major challenges that you, you'll be aware of. And one was, if you like, the demise of Carillion, um, a, a major facilities management and construction company, which sent sent ripples through back up into government um, about the ability of the industry to deliver and the impact on supply chains and the whole structure of our industry. Um, we had the tragedy at Grenfell, which is still, as, which is in the news and still filtering through now. And, um, and those, those, those two things combined with COVID really should be um, allowing the policymakers and industry to work with academia to bring about proper change within our, in our industry. Um, we should be able to now bring about that fundamental change. Whatever, I, I've always tried to lay them, Egan, Farmer, and some commentators say they're not the right vehicle. And perhaps they weren't to bring about change. But if we if we can't respond to Grenfell, we can't respond to Carillion in the right way now, um, I think that's the biggest opportunity that is lost. Similarly for CIB, and that CIB has got the opportunity to bring together governments, agencies from across the, the globe. It is, for me, it is about um, the, um, the employment patterns within our sector and the relationships between the different entities. Um, I think that is where um, we can bring about the best, most progressive change full stop excellent peter thank you very much indeed for that concluding uh, advice um thank you peter mcdermott for joining us today i'm sure that's been a fascinating 
50 minutes for our viewers and our listeners. Are you planning to be at World Building Congress 2022? I'm hoping to, but as I said earlier, uh, I might be represented by my CIBW92 Joint Coordinator, Steve Rowlandson. Um, and one of the one of the things there is to it, that we want to do there is um, rework through what CIBW92 procurement can can be in 2022 and beyond. Well, we're hoping that we'll all be face to face in Melbourne in late June 2022, but um, it's going to be a hybrid format anyway. And um, so uh, I hope Peter is able to, to join us there. And uh, if he is, you know where to, to meet him and, and he'll be online uh, anyway. So um, for, to, to follow up with Peter, if anything he said today has sparked your interest, uh, please do con contact him. We can connect you via the CIB Secretariat. So, so that's it. For more information on all our work, please do have a look at the CIB website, cibworld.org. We, we always welcome any feedback or suggestions from our viewers and our listeners. So if you've got any, any names to put forward of future guests that you think we ought to be talking to, please let us know or anything on, on any aspects of our work, please do contact us. But uh, for today, thank you for watching this edition of CIB in Conversation and goodbye. Thank you.